Eric Hipple is a former NFL quarterback who spent a 10-year career with the Detroit Lions. Prior to his years in the NFL, he played here at Utah State and was voted the quarterback of the century for Utah State. Uh, he threw over 6,000 yards and scored 34 touchdowns. Uh, his NFL accomplishments include two playoff bids, a divisional championship, and the Detroit Lions MVP award for the 1981 season. From 1995 to 2000, Hipple was the color analyst for Fox NFL pregame show in Detroit. Since his 15-year-old son's Jeff, since his 15-year-old son Jeff's suicide in 2000, Eric has devoted his life to building awareness and breaking down the stigma surrounding depressive illnesses. He has received many prestigious awards for his work, including the University of Mission Neubacher Award for working for work with the stigma associated with disabilities, the Detroit Lions Courage House Award, and the Lifesaver Achievement Award, as well as a presidential citation at the American Psychology Association Annual Convention for his many years of community-based work combating adolescent depression and suicide prevention. Eric's message of resilience has provided mental health or mental fitness awareness to professional groups, the military, law enforcement, schools, communities, and through the Under the Helmet program, thousands of high schools and youth coaches nationwide. His book, Real Men Do Cry, received a presidential award. After spending 11 years as a liaison uh, in outreach to the University of Michigan Comprehensive Depression Center, he currently speaks around the world to audiences about his journey. Please join me in warmly welcoming Eric Hipple. First of all, Hillary, that was so wonderful. Thank you so much. I mean, you're talking about setting a mood, but also for me, um, getting an emotional standpoint of view, uh, sometimes it's difficult you know, to open up and, and talk about certain things, but you certainly set the mood, so I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. As well as thanking um, everyone that's uh, been part of the hospitality crew here. Um, Esther Lee, all the way down, and, and Ryan, and thank you all for being really, really nice um, and um, being open. And I also really enjoyed the, the breakout sessions as well. Um, you know, when you talk on your own for a while and you, you, get, you get around, sometimes you forget, like, am I really hitting the spot? Am I touching base? And after going through the, through the sessions, I feel more affirmed and, and feel, yeah, okay, I, I've got something right. I feel like I'm in the right place because we're kind of simpatico. In fact, uh, when Ryan got up here and started talking about, you know, pause wellness as far as being kind of upstream and trying to be that way, ah, I felt right at home because that's really been my mission of late. You should try and be that up, upstream uh, person and try and get stuff done. But, um, you know, before we get too far into it, um, you've got <clears throat> my information there. You heard the intro. I really enjoyed the 10 years I spent with the Detroit Lions. Um, I grew up in Southern California, um, started playing football when I was nine years old. Um, not because I was a great athlete, I just wanted to belong to something, right? And that seemed to be the easiest team to belong to because they took a lot of you. <laughs> so, and I didn't start until I became developed until my junior year in, in high school when finally my body caught up and I started like rising above things and became a starter. And then had my scholarship offer to Utah State University and obviously took that and came here and just things broke really, really wonderful for me. Um, great coach, Bruce Snyder, when he, when he came in, and I became a four-year starter and uh, really enjoyed my time there. And we ended up being the champions, 78-79 um, championship season with um, the group that we had and just back-to-back -back seasons. It was great. So um, I want to just um, acknowledge that. But every time I drive through the canyon, coming over, you know, from, you know, the I-15, coming over the, the valley and coming down the canyon to the valley, it's just so inspiring and so, you know, magical to me because this little cache valley that we have here is just beautiful you know and it was like that for the first time i drove here from from los angeles and, and drove over <laughs> drove over the hill and said what am i getting myself into <laughs> it's a valley we're trapped in here turned out to be not a trap it turned out to be you know a, a sanctuary and um four-wheeling and getting outdoors and, and skiing and everything else all became part of it yes and school too yeah that became part of it as well um, but i loved every second of it um, I, I'm going to start off by, by, um, by just talking about teams for a second because the, I belong to many different teams, you know, from, like I said, from Pop Warner football to high school to college to pros, but, um, but more teams than that even. I mean, because I, you know, we all belong to teams, you know, whether it's sports or, um, or your workplace or your community, and this community is, is a team. And so we have to understand what teamwork is, and, and, and one thing that never never fails to amaze me is, is how 
important it is, but sometimes how it falls by our wayside on what teamwork really means. And teamwork is about not leaving anybody behind. Everybody counts. And you know, not everybody is going to be great every play. And so if I'm talking about football, you know, in order to score and to have mission oriented to win the game, you all have to be getting along together. And some plays, some guy might not do well, some plays, somebody else might fall, but the other person's there to pick him up and support him, everybody. And, uh, and it's so important to be inclusive in that realm because like I said, not everybody is gonna be hitting all the time. Um, and it's accentuated by science, in fact, on how important that teamwork stuff is. And, can I borrow you for a second? Just stand up here. And I'll grab you too, you just right there. Yeah, stand up, yeah. Can you catch? I hope so. Okay, <laughs> so we're gonna play a little game. Here, just right there, you're good. Little game, don't hit the piano. You know. Just we're gonna throw the ball back around, so how many times can we throw it without dropping it? See, this is teamwork, they're going pretty good. All right, that's not bad. Yeah, that's kind of fun, not too bad. I forgot my ball, so I had to use an orange. <laughs> so anyway, now what happens though if all of a sudden, throw it to me, throw it to me, now throw it back to me. Now I'll throw it to you, throw it back to me. Okay, we'll just keep on doing this. How you feel over there? <laughs> look at his face. You can see he's got a look on his face like, well, I'm still here, you know. Hey, are you going to let me play? And pretty soon, as you can tell this is the experiment, what's going to happen? Hey, you're, you're starting to get angry. <laughs> so what actually happens, okay, is if this happens and we just start playing here and ignore him, the human need to belong is so strong that he'll start making kind of like faces like, hey, I'm still here. Hey, you know, make himself known, but we just keep ignoring him and keep playing. What's going to happen then? That's going to change. It's going to change from wanting to participate. It's also going to change to start being angry, right? He's going to feel rejected. And then eventually what will happen, he'll just forget it. So it's a, he might say a few <laughs> curse words towards us, but he'll say, you know, and, and, and walk away, be angry, and he'll go find his own group to play with. And not only that, the people that he finds this group to play with, you know, might be fringe on the fringe as well. But what they're going to do, they're going to form their own team, and they're going to try and get undermine us. They'll try and recruit people away from us. They'll try and, you know, tell everybody our game sucks. You know, they'll, they'll might even go on social media and talk about us. Because rejection hurts so bad. In fact, it shows up in the same place in, the, in brain scans. It shows up the same place that physical pain shows up. That's how painful it is when we ignore somebody and ostracize them. You can sit down now. So, thanks. Um, but it's that important. It's, it hurts that bad. And in fact, you know, I've watched, you know, youth football coaches sometimes, they don't quite understand that. When somebody comes late, and maybe because the, you know, the father has them and they're not, you know, it's a divorced family or something, or the mother has them and shows up late to practice, and he shows up and the coach will say, okay, everybody run because Johnny was late. Well, right off the bat, everybody turns against Johnny. Thanks a lot, Johnny, right? And so he gets ostracized right off the bat. You know what he'll do? He'll end up and he'll go sit on the end of the bench and he'll start looking for other players that are on the coach's best side and he'll start recruiting them. And pretty soon he'll get him over by him and he'll start saying, yeah, our coach, yeah, he's really mean. Yeah, I don't, th I don't think he's that great of a coach, do you? Yeah, in fact, look, he just plays his favorite players and he's starting to build and he becomes a cancer. And he'll undermine and try and defeat the others and it becomes that way because it hurts so bad just because they weren't included. And so it doesn't matter, you know, who you are or what it is, you need to be included because you're part of the picture, you're part of the team. And, and, and in fact, you know, if, if uh, we, somebody does do something wrong, you can still, that's great. I mean, you can still, pun, you know, with punishment, consequences are part of it. There might be consequences to being late. There might be consequences. But that doesn't mean we reject the person. We go ahead and give them whatever their consequence is, but we still have open arms for them. And that goes along with punishments. It goes along with all kinds of different things that we use. But ostracism and kicking somebody out should not be one of them because it undermines the society. It also undermines, you know, our mental health. It's not good at all. So I just want to make sure that we, we have that because the teams that we belong to all the time should be inclusive in that, for that reason. Now I'm going to give a little bit of history, just, you know, background on and how I got into mental health anyway. And you heard the, my intro and, and how I really got there. But, you know, it goes back before, before, before then. Um, you know, I've been successful and, and I love those parts, parts of success uh, that I've had, you know, be able to get to the, uh, Utah State and and end up in their Hall of Fame, and then Detroit Lions, and you know, success there, and and it's been it's been fantastic. But I also went through some major transitions, and and every time you jump a grade, you know, from high school to college, from college to you know to pros, there's a big major jump, and it's a really huge one going from being a pro, you know, all of a sudden 32 years old, and all of a sudden you get cut, released. What do you do now? That's a major transition, and with those comes loss as well. 
And, um, and so it affected me. In fact, going all the way back, and um, I've, said, I've been involved in mental health for a long time, longer than even though that I even knew that I was involved in it. Because we go back to when I was young, and my, my father would say, your mom's not coming out of her room, she's having one of her spells. <laughs> what does that mean? I, I heard somebody talking, I think it was one of the breakouts, talking about what does that even mean? <laughs> or having one of those spells. For a kid, I don't know what that means. Other than the fact that mom's not coming out of her room. So, okay, we just part of, part of life. So then we, we, you go on and, and then uh, you find out that you know, my, my, her sister was a schizophrenia and um, schizophrenic and was actually institutionalized when, when she was young. And so my mom was scared to death that that was going to happen to her. Even though we never talked about it, she lived in fear that she was going to become mentally ill, uh, even though her depression, I guess, didn't count. Um, so then we got older. We never talked about that stuff, so I never knew much about it. I get into um, a couple ups and downs going through high school, but not until I got here to college at Utah State that, all, that it really hit me one year, and it's, a, it's between my junior year, just sophomore and junior year. And, um, and I really can't remember the, the foundation behind it, if I was injured or something had happened, but whatever it was, I just couldn't get out of bed. And it was going into the third quarter of the, of the year, and I couldn't get up, I couldn't go out, and, and I would get up, and I would just go to the door, but I'd come back and get bed again. And so I'll get to there tomorrow. And so I slept in. I'll get there tomorrow. I'll sleep in. Get there tomorrow. Pretty soon, the whole quarter had gone by. And, um, and, uh, <laughs> and I flunked out that quarter. You know? And so I wasn't eligible to play football. Now, you want to see some coaches rally? <laughs> the coaches rallied around me. Whoa! You know? Hey, we've got to get you to summer school. Come on here. And uh, I was all in for that. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I just, you know, so they got me to summer school. I got my grades back up. And we went on my junior and senior year and won the championship back to back. I never really knew why I couldn't get out, get out of bed. And not only that, not one person ever asked me what was wrong, why you couldn't get out of bed. You know, I don't know what they assumed, but it was just, I don't know, I just didn't do it. And so we went on our way because we won the championship, never thought about it again. So that's fantastic. So I get, to, uh, I get drafted by the Detroit Lions. I go there and things break for me really, really wonderfully. Uh, the second year in the league, I become a starter. Great uh, breakout game, great career, playoffs, went to the division one year. Um, then, <clears throat> as Detroit would be, uh, we had three head coaches and five offensive coordinators at the time I was there, so every other year you have to learn another offense. And, um, and by the way, Detroit, I'll tell you right now, people in Michigan, they think the world's coming to an end because they said, you know, hell will freeze over before the Detroit Lions, you know, make it to the Super Bowl. It looks like this might be the year they do it. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> they, think it's, they think this is it, you know, so uh, they're living the end days right now. Uh, but those transitions were, were major. The thing is, you know, when I went through those things, I never learned anything about it. And it really left me ill-prepared for when I went through that transition as an athlete to non-athlete. You know, I, um, I started a business didn't know what to do, so I started a business and kind of took me two years before I got my first account, but then I started making money and I was doing well, but it was about six years out of that that all of a sudden that thing hit me again and I just didn't feel right. I didn't know what was wrong again. I just didn't feel normal. In fact, I heard when Jane was talking earlier today, she's talking about that burdensome feeling. You know, you just felt like, you know, a pretender, like, you know, an imposter that, you know, everybody thinks you're doing great, but you're not. And it got to the point where my business started getting falling apart a little bit. You know, I wasn't paying attention to it. Again, it was hard to get to work. Um, and it all co uh, accumulated into an event where my wife was driving me to the airport. I was going to take a business trip. And the closer I got to the airport, you know, these thoughts that I had been having for a while just kind of welled up. And it seems like it was a very impulsive moment. But it was based on something I had been, th been thinking about for a while. And the closer I got, I just felt like I couldn't make it. And I remember writing a note to my wife. I said, I'm sorry. I love you handed it to her, and she looked at it, she looked at me, and I opened the door and I jumped out of the car. We were going 75 miles an hour when I jumped out of the car. I hit the pavement. Um, I don't remember anything uh, there because I was out. I woke up in the hospital, and I wake up when there's a psychiatrist, and there's my parents had flown in from California, my wife, and they're all looking at me, and I'm all bandaged up because they'd already, they'd already done surgery. And, 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 and I wake up and they're looking at me and they're, they're psychiatrists talking about a plan they can do, you know, we put them in, you know, in, in intensive care and figure out what's going on with them. And I heard that, and this is where stigma is really strong, okay? Mm -mm, that's not gonna happen. I don't know what it was, but it's over now, I'm fine. And I told my parents, did they sign any paperwork, you know, to, 
to admit me, then I, I'll never talk to him again. So they didn't. So time came out, you know, got out of the hospital, bandages came off, and I put my blinders back on, and I just started moving forward. And, and that's what I did. You know, I was still making money, but I was just putting the blinders on and just going through it. I was just behind me now. That's all there was to it. The thing is, I didn't learn anything still. So when my son, who was 15 years old, started going through, you know, I mean, freshman year, well-liked, popular, captain of his freshman basketball team, doing great. But after the holidays, all of a sudden, those same things that I had had, symptoms, he was exhibiting. But I still didn't, couldn't relate to him. Even though I had jumped out of a car and I had those thoughts, I could not possibly see that he could have those thoughts. And so on a Saturday morning, I went and woke him up. I had to leave, I had to go to Vancouver. And I woke him up and he had tears in his eyes. And I said, Jeff, when I get back, we'll figure this stuff out. And I took the trip. And it was the next day when I got the phone call from my wife. She said that Jeff was dead, that you know, he died by suicide. And when you hear those words, it doesn't seem real. In fact, it was so surreal, I just, just wailing came out of me and just, oh my God, what? It's, it's just, can't, this is not true, it can't be happening. But I did, I took the flight, emergency flight back. I went, I went, in, went to the, you know, went to the morgue and, you know, and, and looked at the body and, and uh, it was very, very difficult. And in fact, at that moment, I did not want to live. How can I live with this guilt? You know, and this, just how, not being, not seeing it. How could I live this way? But now, I know what it's like when somebody dies by suicide and you're the survivor. It hurts. It's painful. All that pain just shifts gears and goes into somebody else. So I realized, you know, when I jumped out of the car, I thought everybody else would be better off without me. That's how I thought. That's the mindset. They'll be better off without me. I'm just a burden. And now, right now I know it's not true. And so I, I decided I couldn't do that. So I would just do the next best thing in my mind. I will be numb. And that's what I did for about a year. <laughs> Uh, you know, alcohol was a thing, um, but quite frankly, prescription medication, anything I get my hands on, I was taking just to be numb. And I wasn't paying much attention to my seven-year-old or my 10-year-old that were, that were, um, that were, um, there were seven-year-olds in the next room when it happened. But I wasn't paying much attention to them, their kids, you know, and, and, or even my wife, you know, that, what she might have been going through. It was just up here, just trying to survive. And I did that for about a year, in, uh, and I'll say fortunately, I got picked up on a DUI, so I got arrested for driving uh, while intoxicated and um, got arrested and um, I ended up doing 60 days in jail. And while I'm sitting in there in jail, it, you know, in self-loathing, self-hate, and everything else you can think about, it goes along with me. And, you know, I, I never was really super mad at God. I was mad at me and angry with me. Um, so at least that little piece, you know, hung in there. And in fact, towards the end of that 60 days, that started weighing out and it started getting back and started reading the Bible again, started getting back involved and started, you know, praying again, you know. And, and so what I realized was that everybody that was in there had an excuse, right? Well, this happened to me. I mean, I'm here because, you know, my father was an alcoholic and I'm, I'm here because that person, you know, the chop, cop pulled me over. It was a, he shouldn't have pulled me over. My brake light was fine. It's just all kinds of excuses. And I realized, oh my gosh, is that me? I'm here because my son died, that's my excuse. I said, I don't want to be that guy. So I vowed when I got out, I started getting some answers. And I started, you know, um, getting some information. So I went to the University of Michigan Depression Center, brand new Depression Center. They actually put the title on the, on the center, which is amazing. Um, so I went there and I had this little mini medical school thing. So I took it on, you know, brain illnesses um, and then um, got treatment for myself. But then, then they, they asked me, you know, would you like to be an outreach person? Sure. So they made me out, outreach coordinator. So I remember going to the first day of work and I showed up and I said, okay, I'm here, what do I do? <laughs> and they said, I don't know, you tell me, you're the, you're the outreach coordinator. <laughs> so anyway, oh, okay. So I can do anything I want, basically with just an outreach. And I got really aggressive and started saying, I want programs, I want to see this, I want to, you know, it used to get me angry when a clinician would get up and talk about the research and stuff, but yet you find out it's 11 years before it actually makes the practice. Oh, that's, that's frustrating. Why, why, why don't we know this information for at least those 11 years? And let us make our own decisions on, you know, what that means. And so I got pretty aggressive and started working towards that. But what I really found out was that if you want to be effective and understand what brain illnesses are and mental health, and I'll use mental health, what it really is, you have to understand these things along with it. Because it isn't just a one thing. It is a combination. We are, we are a system. We are not our brain, our body are connected, and our spiritually we're connected. So we are this, and so we have to know a little bit about these and put them in context 
to where maybe a, a, it might fit, you know. Especially for somebody who doesn't know anything, you know, and all of a sudden they're experiencing these things. What is it so I can do something about it? And we had a lot of, I had a lot of fellow players that were struggling. Um, we started doing evaluations on people that are going through the transition. I started working with military and found out their transition is a difficult one. And what I found out was they were like I was. They didn't have any information. And so how are they supposed to know what's actually going on? And so I thought, well, let's, let's do this and start forming programs. The one thing I wanted to make sure of that these guys understood was that, you know, if I'm going to talk about mental health, I want to get the idea that mental illness and, and mental health are separate. Okay, I want them to understand it's a continuum. Because I know a lot of people that have a diagnosable mental illness that are really healthy because they take care of themselves and they're managing themselves really, really well. You know, and I also know a lot of people that don't have a diagnosis, right? Um, but they're not very mentally healthy because of the way they treat themselves and the way they treat other people. And so let's make it a continuum and call mental health what it is. It's a sense of well-being on who you are. You can have a mental illness and still be healthy because of what you do about it. And so let's do this continuum thing. But really it's about a sense of well-being on who you are. Understanding that, you know, I like who I am. You know, I, I do some pretty good things. But, you know, understand that I'm part of my life. And, I'm, uh, and so I can be like myself and appreciate myself. And that way I can handle stresses. I can have, you know, relationships. I can be part of a community. And I can get the most out of myself. That's where I really want mental health to be. But again, stripping it down a little bit, we have to understand kind of how the brain works. The brain is a problem-solving wonder. And the brain plasticity that you hear people talk about, it's real. Our brain does not continue, it does, excuse me, continues to grow and shape itself continually all the way through life, right? Certain times we're trimming things and certain times it's really, really busy, especially in the teenage years when we're forming and, and pruning the preformal cortex and, and adding connections and, and so it, 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 growing and stuff. In fact, it's so good at problem solving, in fact, it's job basically. So what we do when we learn, we start experimenting to test things out. You know, kids are driven for that. You know, they're driven for experimentation at certain ages, middle school, high school. And because they push a boundary, they, they don't know how far they can go before they, they found out, oh, this is not good. But that's why consequences are so important, because otherwise they'll never learn. So we still have to have consequences, right? Not by ostracizing people, but the consequence of being saying, you know, this is good for you or bad for you. You have to <laughs> learn along the way. And so if I do something that's good over and over and over again, it becomes a habit which is fantastic because now I don't have to think about it. My subconscious takes over and it can run it. But the same thing happens for bad choices. That means if I'm not doing good things, I'm doing bad things, right? By my definition, you know, something that's not good for me, then I start creating those habits as well. And so this is how we learn. We continue to do this, this feedback cycle that we have, good, bad, indifferent, experiment. And that's really how we grow. And in fact, you know, when we're young, this is how we start shaping our identity. The fact that, you know, I will learn something, right, and pretty soon, you know, this works for me and everything else, and, and I start shaping how the world is going to be and how I see the world. And so the lens that I look through becomes my core belief system. The core beliefs that I believe in, how the world works based on my experiences and uh, in my environment. And I start looking at, through that lens at everything. And so that means if I'm young and I've got a supportive background, it's people who support me and say, Great job in a sincere way, not a fake way, but great job. Hey, you'll get them next time. Hey, that's okay. You'll learn something from this. Hey, that was fantastic. I knew you could do it. So did you. You know, supportive. Then they come up with a positive outlook on life. Okay. It doesn't mean still things don't go wrong. They do. But they come up with a positive outlook. And when you have a positive outlook, that means all possibilities are open. If I, if I grow up with a negative support system, Right? So my core belief system starts thinking things are negative. Like, oh, you're terrible. You'll never amount to anything. Uh, you're, I knew you'd fail. And we hear those messages, and that becomes our core belief system, saying that, you know what? Then the world is like that. And so I'm kind of afraid to go on to the world. And in fact, I'm, you know, it's a scary place. And I will start living negatively in fear, and that means I try and protect myself. That means my mind now is always focused on crisis, in crisis management. And not on possibilities, it becomes focused on, you know, don't fail again. You know, don't, don't put yourself in that position. And so we, we think differently. You know, and so as we go through these, these core beliefs, as we grow older and stuff, and, and they become kind of our way of thinking, the longer they're ingrained, the more that we think that way. The good news is, though, is we can change it. 
We can change our belief system. We can go from negative to positive. We can go you know, from changing our environment or understanding how they got here in the first place. You know, why, why do these things affect me the way I think this negative way? Or I might myself susceptible to other things that happen to me, right? Because I'm negative and so I'm not looking for solutions. I'm just looking to protect myself. And so one of the ways we can change and it's understanding, you know, our, our emotional content, you know, um, how that works. You know, emotions start with the, with the body sensation. And um, I think we're in, um, I forget which breakout it was, but listening to them. And it was, um, you know, it starts with a, a body sensation, basically. Uh, uh, and I think it was Julie. Anyway, so a body sensation might be like my heart starts beating fast. You know, you know a little anxiety, okay. But what does that mean to me? Normally, if it's a body sensation, it's an automatic. I just have an automatic tendency then. That means here's how I act to this thing. It's fear. I run. Okay. But if it's not fear, if it's a different emotion, but it's, I feel anxiety and I don't understand it, then I can't act differently. But if I understand it, I can think, where is this emotion coming from? Then I can actually think and go up into my you know, thinking mind and say, hey, listen, this isn't what it was. This is something that happened three weeks ago and you're still worried about it. Let it go. So I don't have to run or live in fear, all right? So I can manage it and I can reframe it and reshape it and say, ha, huh. and so that means I might change my behavior. I don't have to run away. And that's a simple example. But emotions are so important for us. The reason why they're important for us is because we all have them. Everyone in the world has emotions, right? And these are the five basic ones. But it gives us the ability to communicate, to connect. Because if I know what sadness is, and I see you're sad, I know how you feel. Because I felt that way before. And so the thing that we call empathy, the ability to connect to somebody, is based on these emotional content. That how it actually works is if I, if I look at someone and you smile, okay, I'll reflect that smile because that's, I get these little mirror neurons in here, and I'll smile and I go, oh, she's happy because that's what a smile is. And I recognize it myself, oh, cool. It happens if you yawn, we all know that changes, right? Everybody starts yawning. Well, I don't even know why I'm yawning. I'm not tired. But we do it, right? Because we feel it. It's also, if you were to laugh back there in the corner, you know, and start giggling about something, don't know what it is, I guarantee you, if you do it long enough, it'll start spreading, right? In fact, you know, comedians actually use this. They'll put a really good laugher in the middle of their audience, right? And they'll, be, you know, they'll be laughing really loud and everything else. And even if the comedian, you know, is terrible, they'll start laughing. So it makes his job a little bit easier. <laughs> so, so, um, so if you ever hear one person laughing a lot and nobody else is, that's, that's who that guy is. <laughs> but it's, it's the pieces that connect us, right? And so as long as we have that, that part where we connect, we have to understand the emotions. Well, the emotions are important to understand. So emotion awareness is really where we get our, our, our understanding from where, where it came from, uh, the skill to recognize it. So if I recognize it myself, I can recognize it in somebody else. And, um, and I, I can manage it, okay? But emotional awareness, okay, also can be avoidance. So I brought my little ball again. So imagine this is, you know, a little bigger, okay? And it's full of air, okay? And I'm standing waist deep in a pool, all right? If I don't know what my emotions are or I'm afraid of them, you know, I just want to bury them. So I hold them down underneath the water. You know, it's going to keep frightening to get up. But that's okay, I can keep this thing down there for a long period of time. You know, I can fight it down. The thing is, I'm not learning anything from my emotion. I don't know where it comes from. You know, I just don't want to, I want to avoid it. And I don't get any information from it. I'm not learning anything. So what happens though, when all of a sudden there's a crisis moment and my intention is directed over here for a second, that's when this thing pops up because I took my eye off of it. And guess what happens? In the worst crisis moment that you have, these emotions come flowing out, right? And it's a, it's a, in a deluge, you know, all over you. And it's just, you know, oh, where'd this thing come from? And you, uh, you know, and, and it's hard, right? It's confusing. The same token for, if I were to, you know, um, hold my emotion up in the air so it's not on the water, it's up here and above it. So this may mean, you know, I'm, I'm really attentive to it, but I don't quite understand them. In fact, I feel them all the time, but I don't know what to do with them. Put your arm up like this for a second. Hold, hold your emotion up there high, okay. Now, <clears throat> doesn't seem like much right now, but I guarantee if you hold your arm up like, without even a ball, hold your arm up like that for the rest of the day, it's gonna get tired. It's gonna be exhausting. 
And pretty soon, right, it's going to like this. And what you're going to do is be talking about it. And I think we all know people that are over stimulated by their emotion that just talk, 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 talk about it, but don't know exactly where it's come from. Okay, you can put your arm down. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to have to talk fast. I'll put my two-minute voice on. Ready? Go. <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, so what we really need to do is just have it sit here like right in front of us. So we can understand what it means. We can get information from it. Where does this thing come from? Is it something that happened before? Is it something I'm worried about in the future? Where is this thing coming from? What's stimulating this? What body emotion is it? Okay. So that way we can manage emotions. And the reason why it's important to manage these things is because emotional intelligence not only helps us understand, but it helps us read other people and help them with, with, with what they might be going through so we can recognize it. And that recognition uh, is important in many different aspects uh, on the emotional left, being able to connect with people. Okay, things that do it can affect us. Um, I'll say injury is one of them, but the reason I didn't put this up there was for that. It was just, it's really easy to see I've got a broken ankle. Okay, um, once, you, once it zeroes in. Um, yeah, it's, once, once you see it, you go, oh, yeah, it's ugly. But, and, you know, when I broke it, 60,000 people in Candlestick Park, you know, San Francisco, all went, oh, at the same time. And um, I heard it snap, but I didn't feel anything, I was in shock. But not until I heard these people go, oh, and I looked down, and I, oh, <laughs> and then I felt it. It's like, oh, God, I could see it, and it was terrible. Well, they put a pin in it, placed it, and they had, tore all the ligaments and tendons, they put it back around. So I wouldn't play one more year after this. But um, the main part is that you can see that. The trouble with brain illnesses is you can't see it, right? So how do you know you have it? You know, like, it's not like your foot's on backwards. <laughs> you know, okay, so how do I know? Well, it becomes on how the person's behavior happens. That's why you hear sometimes somebody might have a, a not get diagnosed for a long period of time because it takes a while before it actually manifests itself to where people start recognizing it. Or a crisis happens and now it's like, okay, where does this thing come from? Uh, you find out, oh my gosh, they've been thinking this way for quite a while. You know, and so these are major brain illnesses. Main thing is early recognition is key, way upstream. Okay, so we don't have to wait, you know, the six years, seven years, 11 years before somebody gets diagnosed. We can do something with it early because we do have some pretty effective treatments. Okay. Um, the symptoms are here, um, and these are common for most brain illnesses. So I put it, you know, as a group. But for depression, for example, you have to have at least like seven of these to be present and also, you know, for at least two weeks or longer. Uh, and they have to kind of interfere with your life. Okay, just so. We understand that. I will say out of those symptoms, the worst one I believe would be the helplessness. Because if I feel crappy every day and I don't know why, see, I don't know anything about mental health, and I don't know why, I just feel lousy every day. Pretty soon I think, is this the way life is? I'm gonna feel like this way for, for, for now on? Well, I, I can't feel this way. And so I'll start doing other things. And my behaviors might change to try and feel differently. I just wanna feel something different, right? And so maybe it's substance use, maybe it's risky behavior. Um, which can mean a lot of things. Um, and of course, it can also mean, you know, thoughts of death and suicide thinking. You have to have three things to happen for a suicide to happen. One is, and you heard it, before, heard it said a couple times, times, one is you feel like a burden. The second one is a person who does feel like a burden typically will isolate, okay? And that doesn't mean they lock themselves in a the room, it could be, but they feel alone. So I could be in a group of people, right? and still feel alone because I think everybody else is doing great. I'm the only one that doesn't, so I feel like I'm separated. Okay, and the third thing that happens is a person can actually override self-preservation and actually think that death is a possibility because it's a relief. Okay, I don't know who that person is. I don't need to know. All I need to do is stop one of these things. So I, got, I can make this person so they don't feel like a burden. They're inclusive, you're part of it, so you're not alone. But also, it might be your third time at, at rehab. It's okay, you know, we're here behind you. I'm not gonna enable you because there are consequences, but I still love you, and you're still part of us, okay? But once I do that, then I can knock out the suicidal thinking. And one of the, how do we do that? So how do we recognize? And we have the best tool. We have it built into us. It's our empathy. It's the ability to connect with emotion, with, with being able to read body, con, you know, body language um, and listen. You know, and if I feel something that's not right, I won't be afraid to ask. And that's the biggest thing. You know, QPR stands for question, persuade, refer. It's a, it's a suicide prevention model. But you'll question because if I feel like you, you're not doing well and you're a friend of mine, and I'll say, so what's going on? What's your, what, how are they gonna react? Oh, I'm fine, because <laughs> that's what we do, right? 
But if I feel something, I'll, I'll say, no, really, what's going on? No, I'm all right, I'm all right. Don't give up. I mean, if you feel something's not quite right, because I can feel it, seriously, what's going on with you? Because I, I feel like you're going through something. About the third time you say that, they'll get it. They'll go, oh my gosh, they see me. Oh, they care. Oh, okay, or I'm that obvious, that I need to talk about this. It becomes apparent. And so then they'll come out and say, well, three weeks ago this thing happened, I had me a little sleep, and, you know, but they get a chance to talk. And I think that's the, uh, a goal that we need to get somebody off that suicidal thinking. I'm gonna, I've only got a few minutes, but I'm gonna hit these things really quick, so bear with me. Trauma is a thing. Trauma affects us, but it is a personal experience. We always think it's the thing that's the trauma, it's not. It's a, how the person experiences the thing. That's why two people can walk into a room and one be traumatized and not the other, because it's some experience they've had in the past or something, or a way it affects them, it's their personal experience with it. And that's terrible when you start thinking, oh, what do you, what do you, what's wrong with you? What do you, what? we see that all the time. What do you, you know, and they don't, might not get believed, especially in sexual assaults and stuff, because their memory gets fragmented, gets, gets uh, fragmented. So it's hard to recall a memory and put it back together again. Transitions are difficult. So I think if we can take transitions and we all went through COVID, which is the worst transition, though everybody went through it. But this was just certainly the loss of grief, identity, and everything else that we kind of lost. We need to turn it into a transformation so we can reinvent ourselves and heal and get a new support system. Stress is a good thing or a bad thing? Yes, yeah, it's both, right. Because we actually have good stress, right? We have positive stress, it gets us activated, gets us ready to, you know, to go perform better. But also, you know, we have fun. We go down a roller coaster, woohoo, right? And my heart was beating pretty fast when I went, but I really enjoyed it in scary movies. But we also have negative stress. And that's a hypervigilance, and, and uh, they were talking about that over in um, uh, Julie's uh, breakout, about the hypervigilance and the vagal nervous system and how we get stuck in it, how we have to get unstuck in it, okay? We have to move past that point. And I will say this, and, and I'm talking as fast as I can right now, but <laughs> this is really important, though. From an environmental standpoint of view, okay, stress control is done with this. Predictability, controllability, trust, relationships, and purpose, okay? We don't get stressed out when we know where we're doing and where we're going. That's why we have calendars. It's predictable, okay? Humans love control. I want to control everything. Well, there's certain things I can't control, right? So then my controllability becomes, I get to control what I do next. So don't think about the things you can't control. Just control what you, the ability you have to what you do next. Relationships, being in relationships is really uh, impactful. And we need it. We're human beings. We need to be connected. Trust, I feel safe. And of course, purpose and meaning. But when we go through certain things, a move, uh, loss of a job, uh, financial relationship breakups, these things get yanked away. We've got to put them back in place or help a person surround themselves with it. Resilience is the ability to bounce back. A resilience plan is a way to do it. Have a support system. Know it ahead of time. Don't wait for crisis. Know it ahead of time. Who is it you can talk to? And second of all, then, you know, what are the coping strategies that I have? Exercise, breathing, when the crisis is right on top of me, how do I, okay, deep breathing, what do I have, okay? And then uh, hope building, because, you know, I've got to get through it. That means that, you know, I believe I'll be stronger when it's over with, or the, every cloud has a silver lining, some sort of hope mechanism. And then, of course, um, uh, solving the problem so it doesn't happen again. Okay. Humor, stretching, deep breathing, meditation, positive music. Visualization, be able to picture yourself, close your eyes, and be someplace else than here for a few moments and nothing else just escape for a few moments. And then mindfulness. Mental fitness, this is the shift. This is way upstream. This is for everybody, okay? How do we become a little bit better at our mental health? First of all, most people live in two worlds. They live in a world of choice. I have, God has given me free will, free reign. I have, uh, ability to act on those choices and because of that i have full acceptance if i make a mistake i'll own it okay but that gives me acceptance also means i learn from it but if i do something well i want to acknowledge that too right because that's how we how we become you know uh healthy and fit otherwise i live in the blame world that means like i feel like i have no control over anything and so when something happens to me it's their fault or, hey, I, wasn't, I didn't ask to be born to an alcoholic father, so there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah, you can. It's what you do about something. So you still have a choice, right? But it's, otherwise I feel trapped, worry, and I feel like I have no control over my life, and I'm just waiting for the next shoe to drop. 
And that's a terrible way to feel. And in fact, that anxiety and stuff that you feel anxious all the time means that guess what? I'll go to the substances, I'll go to those all the behaviors and, and change that as well. So last but not least, these six things all fit together. It's about recognizing the choices that we make. I didn't say make good ones or bad ones, I just want you to recognize them. 90% of the stuff we do in a day is all good choices. We make great choices all the time. But we don't recognize them a lot of times because we get used to just hearing the bad things, right? So listen to the good things. Self-esteem, once it comes up, I want to create boundaries. A good healthy boundary means that I can allow the people I choose to go inside my boundary and I can be vulnerable and open and I can have true relationships. And it also means that I can have communication and solve some of these problems. But it does take a commitment. You have to do it for more than one day. So when I talk to students, I say, give it two weeks. At, when you go home at night, think about all the things you did in the daytime. Recognize all the good choices you made. Okay, and it'll start changing your life. And it will. It will change somebody's life. And, um, and I think if we live this way, then we can live in a community. We can have a sense of well-being on who we are. Doesn't mean things don't go wrong, but when they do, we have the ability to choose what we do about it. And one of those things might be therapy. It might be helping somebody else to get the therapy. You know, it might be a way of reaching over and picking up a teammate when they need help. And so um, with that, I just want to say thank you for having me. Enjoyed this, and I enjoyed coming back to Logan. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.